The year is 1944, the date June 6. The small fishing harbor of Port N. Basin is a key objective of the Overlord plan. The port lay between Omaha and Gold Beach. Heavily defended on the high cliffs, known as the western and eastern features. With trench systems dug in, two pack 38s and one pack 36. With concrete casemates and two flagships, an attack from inland was decided the best option. The job of taking the port fell to 47 Royal Marine Commando. They left the Solent in two ships on the 5th of June. At 5 a.m. on the 6th of June, eight miles off the Normandy coast, they were loaded into 14 landing craft, each carrying 30 marines and headed for Gold Beach. At 9.30 a.m. they headed for WN-37 Snells which should have been taken by the Hampshire Regiment at 7.30 a.m. Seeing the beach was still being contested, Commanding Officer Lieutenant Colonel Phillips, decided to go up the beach to find a better place to land his troops. As the landing crafts turned making themselves parallel to the beach, the big German guns at La Hamel, and at Longs, were able to hit the now bigger targets. As a result of this one landing craft was hit, 12 marines were killed, 11 were injured but they were still able to reach the shore. As the other landing craft moved in, they had to cross a wide band of Belgian gates many of which were tipped with mines. The tide covered many of the obstacles, preventing the obstacles from being removed by the marines and four of the landing craft were impaled and sunk by attached explosives. Some marines swam ashore but 43 men were lost. The beach was a shambles and the commandos had landed over a mile stretch between 9.45 and 10.15. Mustering on the beach by Major Donnell, many weapons and much other equipment, such as wireless sets, had been lost. Reduced to 340 men the commandos, under fire, now penetrated the enemy front line and embarked on a 12-mile march through enemy-held territory behind the German front line towards its objective, Port N. Bessin. The importance of this port was that it was required as the Normandy terminal of Pluto, the pipeline under the ocean, which ran from Foley to the Isle of Wight to France and was intended to supply a large proportion of the petrol which would sustain the 21st Army Group. One man was killed and 11 wounded during the march as several enemy positions were overcome. On marching into La Rosière the commandos find the position was still in German hands, it should have been taken by the Devonshire Regiment, so the commandos had to take it. The battle unfolded with a troop attacking some machine guns on the flanks, and X troop attacked the main body of Germans. After taking the position the commandos had to keep moving on. The commandos moved off from La Rosière at 7.45 pm in the same order of march, the route was entirely across the country over the Mass de Cradal, across the road leading south of Fontenay and then on to the lane leading to point 72. At first the move was without incident. Just after passing La Buanerie, both X and B troops exchanged shots with isolated groups of enemy, but opposition was soon overcome, or bypassed. Occasional prisoners were taken, including one regimental sergeant major en route to visit his girlfriend at the brothel in Weestrian. After arriving at point 72 at 10.30 pm, it was too late to start the attack so it was decided to wait until the morning. While most of the men tried to sleep at point 72. Some men were sent out on patrol. Moving down a lane in the hamlet of Escures, they came across a German bunker which had been turned into an aid station, so the British took over half of it and shared it with the Germans. Early on the morning of the 7th, the commandos patrolling around Escures were surprised to come across some Germans, strolling along heading to the aid station to report sick. They were taken prisoner and they told the commandos, there is a German headquarters about a mile away at Chateau de Maison. It was decided the attack should start at 4 p.m. The port's outer defenses consisted of an entrenched and concreted position, the weapon pits, but the main defenses were two heavily defended positions on the western and eastern features, each rising to 200 feet on either side of the harbor, 
and the harbour area itself. A second aid station was set up, as it was thought the one in Escures was a bit far from the action. Once it was set up the medical officer went for a walk thinking the weapon pits had been cleared and on walking up the road saw they were full of Germans. Just at that moment X troop broke cover from the tree line and ran at the position with bayonets fixed shouting as they ran. The occupants surrendered. Meanwhile A and B troop had made their way to the church undetected. A troop went up Rue National to clear the western feature, while B troop headed down to the harbour to clear out the eastern feature. As the troops moved into position to start the attack, HMS Emerald was at sea about midway between Aramanche and Port N. Bessin when, about 11.30 hours, orders were received to bombard the eastern feature from 1400 hours to 1600 hours. At 1500 hours, HMS Emerald opened fire at a range of 5,000 yards, engaging targets on the eastern feature. The fob had good communication with the ship and this bombardment continued until 1600 hours as planned. At 1550 hours, a squadron of typhoons appeared. Ground targets were engaged very accurately by rockets and cannon fire. Another squadron appeared five minutes later and the fire from these aircraft was also very accurate. At 1600 hours the field battery started to smoke the port, and the high ground on either side. They were greatly assisted by a grass fire on the eastern feature, and also by the dust and smoke which resulted from the naval bombardment. As the smoke cleared, a troop headed up to the western feature, they were accompanied by a gendarme. They met the first belt of wire about 75 yards up the track. Lieutenant Goldstein went forward with Corporal Amos and Marine Wood, covered by two Bren guns and blue wire with Bangalore torpedoes. Splitting into two groups, two sections on the right of the track under Lieutenant Wilson headed to the bunker on the cliff, the other two sections on the left track under Lieutenant Goldstein headed to the top of the feature. Lieutenant Wilson's two sections start taking fire from the two flagships and the bunker above them taking heavy casualties, so they decide to pull out. As Lieutenant Goldstein sections made their way to the top of the feature, they came under heavy fire and they also pull out. Corporal Amos was tending to a wounded man when a German grenade exploded and stunned him. He was taken prisoner. The Germans start discussing if they should shoot him as per the orders from Hitler regarding commandos. But as he was helping the wounded they think he is a medic. So he has to pretend to be a medic and help the German wounded soldiers. After this he falls asleep. Of the 60 commandos who went up the western feature 24 are now casualties of which 12 are dead. Captain Cousins collected Lieutenant Wilson and about 28 other rats. He led them via the church and cemetery down the road leading to the inner basin. Meanwhile B troop had made their way into the inner basin taking 10 Germans prisoner, but they start taking fire from a house and other German positions on the eastern feature. The Germans had lifted the bridge of the harbor so the only way around was inland. With A and B troop fighting from house to house, working their way around to the eastern feature. The CO met Major Donnell with Q Troop. The CO told him that the flagships were being troublesome and that he was to get into the houses facing the basin and assist B Troop in their assault on the eastern feature and especially the flagships. They were issued with a Piat and Major Donnell gave orders for them to move to the southeast corner of the inner basin, via the churchyard. Just short of the church Q Troop came under machine gun fire from the direction of the harbor. Captain Vincent took number 9 section with the Piat through to the road running parallel and they made their way via houses, gardens and yards to a cafe and start attacking the ships. About 2100 hours Captain Cousins reported to the CO that he had been within 20 yards from the top of the feature and said, if you can give me 25 men, I'm quite certain I can get to the top. The CO decided to use Q Troop only half of Q Troop had succeeded in getting ashore the previous day. Just after 2200 hours the CO heard them give an almighty cheer and saw them move forward over the crest. 
they were still visible when Captain Cousins fired a red very light. This was the signal for A Troop to wheel to the left and Q Troop to the right. A Troop moved along the top of the hill through several wire fences, breaking up into smaller parties to deal with pillboxes. They were making good progress and had nearly reached the wire fences at the far end when they came under very heavy fire. Captain Cousins told his men to get into some empty slip trenches and took four men forward with him, through the gap in the wire where the path passed through it. They went down the cliff path and disappeared from sight. The remainder of A Troop heard Captain Cousins shouting quite a lot. They also heard Tommy gun and German machine gun fire. Lieutenant Wilson ordered an advance and when they had gone about 40 yards they found Captain Cousins. He had been killed by a grenade. On reaching the top of the path, Q Troop wheeled to the right firing their weapons continuously from the hip for about 100 yards, at this moment seven Germans, including an officer, about 50 yards ahead surrendered. Captain Vincent sent two prisoners of war ahead of him so that he wouldn't be surprised by mines. They climbed through a fence and had gone about 100 yards as far as the path along the edge of the cliff where an oberleutnant, with a white goatee beard surrendered. He spoke good English. Seven of the prisoners were sent down the track without delay. He then took his party westward along the cliff path for about 600 yards, all the time making the oberleutnant call upon his men to surrender. At times there was some argument between the officer and various Germans who dimly appeared in the almost complete darkness. They appeared to be arguing whether they should or should not surrender. However, they all did surrender. Awakened at 0400 hours by a German officer who gave Corporal Amos a cigar and said Comerod, prisoner. There was another man with him. Leaving the dugout Corporal Amos saw a crowd of Germans who had two white flags. Overnight the Germans found out the weapon pits and eastern feature had fallen. Corporal Amos tried to lead them down the way he had come but they wouldn't go that way and kept pointing to the ships. They then all went down a wooden and concrete ramp leading down the cliff. The Germans started waving the flags. Corporal Amos started to walk towards the town and the 23 Germans followed him. The troop took them over about 0500.